So uh, this morning we have got uh, Miriam Naimo, who is from Turing Institute slash Newcastle University, and Ryan Jenkinson, who is head of strategy at the Centre for Net Zero. Uh, so I'll quickly introduce both. Then we're going to have a talk and a demonstration from Miriam, and then a talk from Ryan. So uh, Miriam is a group leader at the Alan Turing Institute and a senior research associate at Newcastle University. She's been working in the e-mobility sector for over 10 years and collaborating with the automotive and energy industry on EV charging infrastructure and interaction with the electric grid. Miriam sits on advisory boards, advancing solutions to decarbonise transport and electricity, and has secured over £1.3 million of funding from UK research and innovation to investigate smart charging and vehicle to grid flexibility in mass deployment conditions. And then uh, Ryan's the head of strategy at the Centre for Net Zero, which is a research unit founded by Octopus Energy. He leads high impact research projects that deliver fast, fair and affordable energy transition and acts as a critical bridge between the centre's technical work and broader uh, engagement activities. Prior to joining CNZ, Ryan was the lead data scientist on the commercial electric vehicle trial Optimize Prime. <laughs> That's a great name. Uh, his models and tools provide insights that enabled Uber to understand optimal allocation of public charge point infrastructure in London. In addition to this, through the analysis of real-time telemetry data, he helped Royal Mail establish how their petrol and diesel fleet could transition to electric vehicles whilst trialling innovative flexibility services to the grid. Okay, so Miriam, please uh, take it away. Uh, we'll have all the talks and then we'll have questions at the, at the end, please. But if, in the meantime, if you think of a question, you can put it in the chat as we go. Great, thank you, David. I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, so our mission is to uh, decarbonize, uh, de democratize electricity distribution network analysis. Understanding how electricity networks are coping with the change in electricity demand and generation is key for a successful transition to a better energy system. However, there is a gap between those with the data and capability to understand electricity networks and those working on other parts of the energy transition jigsaw. So what you're seeing here is um, a screenshot when you access the website that you see below, and I also posted the link to it, of our electric vehicle network analysis tool. Event analyzes the impact of electric vehicles and other low carbon technologies on electricity distribution networks. As you can see, event is accessed through a web browser and presents the user in one place with relevant network simulation parameters. And this is what you can see on the top half and a choice of several electricity network models, for example, an urban network or an urban rural network, demand and generation data that are built in in the tool options to change the penetration levels of uh, these data, and also crucially, users can upload their own data to simulate the impact on the networks. Now we think event helps users link their work on the net zero transitions to impact that may arise within electricity networks. It is easy to use uh, by abstracting complexities of network analysis, and it is openly available to help bring it to a wide range of stakeholders. So this is an example of input data. For example, if you have smart meter data, you can just input it on the network. That smart meter data can already contain or take into account, for example, electric vehicles. But if you have uh, smart meter data with no electric vehicle in there, you can separately upload electric vehicle data. It's showing an example of some of the low voltage networks we are using. I'll talk about them in detail in a bit. And this is an example of the output. Here we are seeing voltage impact on uh, five low voltage networks that were modeled in detail. So before going into a bit more detail on the data we are using on the network models, I just wanted to briefly talk about uh, what were the drivers of our work. So a couple of years ago, we were working on a project focusing on electric vehicles. That project really aimed to understand how people are using, back then it was a new technology. So we installed data loggers 
on those cars. And it allowed us to collect over 1 million kilometers driven and 40,000 charging events. We had a mix of private and fleet drivers. We had some drivers live, living in urban areas, other in rural areas, and those drivers had access to home charging, but also crucially work and public charging infrastructure, including fast chargers. So really it gave us an insight on how users would use, how different type of users would use electric vehicles using different type of charging technologies. So we had EV user data, and on another project, we had network data, but these were two separate projects. The car company was leading one, the DNO was leading another one, and we came to the DNO with the electric vehicle data, and the DNO, uh, provided those uh, network models, network data, we put them together, and uh, we managed to understand the impact on two real world networks. And our findings challenged the standard view that uh, overestimated the impact of electric vehicles on electricity networks. And we had actual charging data we had actual networks. In the case of electric vehicle data, what led to the results challenging the standard view is that in real world, these people did not always charge their car from an empty battery during peak time, but also they did not charge their car every day and they did not always charge their car at the same location. Because as I mentioned, they had access to home charging, but also work charging. And that reduced the impact on the networks. So in the urban case, up to 60% penetration of EVs on that specific urban network caused issues. But that was not the case for the rural one. The rural one, we saw problems at the 15% penetration level. So two main findings for that work. First, real world data is important because assumptions can lead to overestimating the impact, but also, these spoke studies are important because electricity network are not a homogeneous group. And it is important to understand the impact on different types of networks. And we, may, we managed to do that because we had data from totally different project than the network data. And we thought it would help if we can do something for after these projects and for outside the project team. And this is how we got eventually event out uh, which I just mentioned, it's easy to use, it's openly accessible. Who could use it? We foresee a range of stakeholders in the energy sector. For example, companies such as uh, Octopus Center for Net Zero who have smart meter data and might want to understand the impact on different smart meter tariffs that they would introduce. So what is the impact of agile tariff on electricity distribution networks? And we'll talk about that a bit later. It could also be used maybe as a teaching tool for the next generation planners, or maybe for users who want to build on it, add some modules like a cost module. So not just understand the impact, but understand the cost. So again, the link uh, is in the chat. Please do check it. You, you should arrive to this landing page. You click on build network, and then you could do what I've just described. In the background, what's happening? So we have built that front end you see in view. And everything is running using Microsoft Azure Cloud Compute. There, were, there are different ways of doing things. We chose cloud-based computing, and we also chose Microsoft Azure because we had access to, uh, to Microsoft Azure uh, credits. OK. The back end, so where we are uh, building those network models, simulating them, we're doing it also in uh, some Azure tech, specifically Azure web, uh, web apps. And we are using Fast API to link that front end to the back end. We're finalizing the last bits of work on this, but all what you see here is available. So it's not just that you can go and access the website and run the simulation, you can also download all the code behind this website 
So as I mentioned, if you wanted to add a cost module, you could. Now, uh, we built the networks using OpenDSS. So this is an open source uh, tool developed by EPRI to help you model and simulate electricity distribution networks. I'll be interested to hear from the audience if there are other people who use it as well. Uh, the demand and generation data, we are processed it using Python and the code to run the analysis is also done uh, with Python and OpenDSS. Now, before I move on to the tool, I just wanted to mention that there are things starting to happen in this space. So you, you probably heard of the energy network association work with the open, with the ordinance survey, and they are developing an energy system map. So what the OS and ENA are doing is this map where you can see the network, where you can see available cap capacity. What we are doing here is you don't just see it, but you can actually model and simulate it. It's a time series analysis. There is also this massive project, or at least this is what they say it is, by Google. So X is a moonshot factory uh, under Alphabet, so a, a, a Google company. And they also want to develop this big digital twin of the electricity network. I'm not sure if they're aiming to develop the electricity network of the whole wide world. And they also mentioned developing at different levels, but it's great to see how much happening in the space of digitalization of the energy networks and our work fits into that. So back to our work, in this current version of the tool, we are using an integrated medium voltage, low voltage distribution network. So for the MV part, we used UK GDS. And for the LV part, we used low voltage networks based on actual real world networks developed by a project called LVNS. Separately from our tool, you can already download this integrated MV LV network from Matt's, who is the co-host of this webinar, GitHub page. And also Matt wrote the simulation code and the network model behind event. So any in detail questions on the networks, please take it with Matt. So I mentioned that right now in this version of events, we have this UK GDS LVNS generic network. This is a pseudo real network. So it is not an actual network that exists in real world, except the LVNS part, but it is representative of a UK network and both projects has been validated by DNOs. So we're confident that when we're running a simulation with this network, we're getting reasonable results. But what if we want to know what's happening on an actual network, on an actual MVLV network? Luckily, recently, Ofgem, the energy regulator in the UK, has proposed that network operators start sharing network models in a format called common information model. WPD, for example, has already published their SIM models down to the 11 kV. So what we're working on right now is translating those SIM XML models into open DSS models so that we can upload them into event. And then in the drop-down box of event where you have the urban network the urban rural network based on this UK GDS network, you'll have also a lar larger list where you can simulate an actual, for example, WPD network model. So I spoke about the networks, but another important component of our tool is the data. And over the past couple of years, more and more energy data is becoming available. One of them is an electric vehicle charging data from the uh, from WPD, from their electric nation trial. And they have made 18 months worth of uh, charging data available from both 3.7 kilowatt and seven kilowatt charging. Now, working with the data required a bit of work from our part, so we did need to process that data and make it usable. And you can access it as part of the tool. And when our GitHub repos become available, you can also download these 18 months worth of data. We have also made available photovoltaic data. 
So this website called PV Output is a website where users who installed photovoltaics uh, are making their data available. That's great because researchers like us can go to that website, download a bunch of PV data from one area and do some network analysis. So the data is available in five minutes and some, uh, some data is available in 15 minute resolution. What we have done is we processed it into 30 minute resolution and also made it available on the tool. Obviously you can see here that uh, in winter, there is much less PV output compared uh, than in the summer, both in terms of the duration of when you can have that in the day, but also in the power capacity. Uh, a couple of more things to talk about on data. Uh, at uh, Newcastle, uh, there is this new, really new and shiny uh, fast charging station hub that contains six fast chargers. Four of them are 50 kilowatts and two of them are 175 kilowatt chargers. So those 175 chargers are quite new. You don't see a lot of them yet. Uh, partly because not all cars can charge at that high uh, power. And uh, the company who installed and running this charging station is called Fastnet. And by, they provided us with around uh, 251 charging days at 30 minute power values from the site. So we couldn't make available all that information available because it is commercially sensitive. So they don't want to divulge how well it's doing the site, for example, but they let us uh, include in the event tool, a couple of aggregated profiles that give you an idea of what a fast charging station could do if installed on a network. And some data that is not available in the tool but part of why we developed that tool. Uh, we have a, a project called IFO Future where we're collecting data from vehicle to grid chargers. Now, if I wanted to understand what is the impact of that charging technology, like not just charging, but also discharging, then I can get the data similar to what you're seeing here. Uh, but this is just showing the power of the charger following the frequency. So it is this discharging uh, the charger would discharge if there is a drop in frequency, as an example. I could take that time series of the V2G charger, put it in event, and understand the impact of V2G. So after this future project finishes, or any other entity that has data of vehicle to the chargers can use it to understand the impact on the net. And finally, data from uh, Octopus. So Ryan, who will also be talking about their work in Octopus, provided us with around 100,000 smart meter data. And this smart meter data is excellent because it has so much variety. So it had usage before the lockdown, use, usage during and after the lockdown, uh, usage from households who do not have any low carbon technologies, uh, whole days usage, weekend usage, uh, households with electric vehicles and heat pumps. So you could understand those different variables on the networks. And this is what we're doing now in a collaboration with Ryan and Octopus Center uh, for Net Zero. You're seeing here examples of those profiles coming out of the event tool. So we have urban versus rural uh, users, and some of them have low carbon technologies, some of them don't. And you can see, for example, uh, the peak with rural users is a bit higher than with the urban users. And when you have uh, low carbon technologies, those octopus users have shifted their peak to midnight. And most probably, and Ryan can comment on that, those smart meter tariffs are much cheaper uh, at midnight. So people are using the cheaper tariffs to, for example, charge their cars. So we use this data with event to uh, run the network analysis. And here we can see the uh, voltage impact on the rural network without low carbon technology and with electric vehicles and heat pump. And the immediate thing we notice here is the voltage drop. It is still within statutory limit, but there is a voltage drop. This is for the urban as well, uh, a, vo a voltage drop with EVs and heat pumps, but really 
no issues on the network voltage at MV. Now, if we look at the transformer powers, then it's a different issue. While we don't have an issue in the urban network, we can see that we're getting close to capacity. And the, while with the rural, we both have an issue on the primary substation and on the secondary with one specific low voltage network where it, it exceeded the capacity of that transformer. And here it links back to the point about bespoke network analysis. So we are running five networks here and only one presented issues on those LV networks. So do we reinforce all those five LV networks or maybe we target the one that's going to present issues first? Okay, so all this work has been done with the support of my colleagues, including Matt, who's uh, co-hosting this webinar. Uh, more information you can find on the website and the link of event. And we also organize a webinar here about uh, specifically on smart charging technologies. Before I go uh, and give a live demo on the tool, maybe I'll just uh, pause a bit to check if there are any questions. Hi, Miriam. Yeah, there are a few questions, I think, in the chat. Um, okay. So, uh, let's just... Uh, yeah, but just can I confirm that you see the website? Yeah, yeah, we can see the okay. website. Okay, so maybe it's better just to take some questions and then I do the live demo. Yeah, well, this is a couple. The first one's very simple, I think. It just says, can you make all these valuable links available in the chat or via email later? Of course. So uh, this is, a, this is uh, that's the uh, link to the event tool, if you just wanted to check it, Linda. And uh, there is a resource section where you can find links to, for example, the uh, Turing group. The sim is proprietary and expensive. Are there plans to migrate to open standards? Well, I mean, this is a sim question. This is not an event question, but I'm definitely interested in having this conversation with Robbie to understand uh, why sim is proprietary and expensive. Like, I would understand some of the issues with think XML, which is behind the SIM, but I would definitely want to understand why, like why is it proprietary and expensive? Maybe after the demo, I definitely would like to have this conversation with Robbie either now or separately. All right, so uh, here we go. I mean, if you can actually go and check it as well, because I want several people to try it at the same time to check if uh, the infrastructure we have is really slowing down if several people are using it at the same time, which I think it will, but I actually want to see how slow it becomes. So here we build the network. On the top bit, I have the electricity distribution network parameter. So I can go with an urban network or an urban rural network. I keep it at urban now. You can change the transformer scaling. And we have some information here of what we mean by that. So if you remember in the rural case, I had the capacity of the transformer exceeded with electric vehicle at heat pump. If I double the size of the transformer, then I'm not going to see an issue. Obviously, there are cost implications. I'm going to leave it now, uh, the net distribution network parameters as they are. I'll also uh, comment that we are here assuming we have 80% of loads on that network are residential, but you can make it one, which means all the network is houses, or you can make it 50-50. Take into account the real world where you have schools, commercial buildings, hospitals, et cetera. On the right hand, uh, the default is simulating low voltage networks that are close to the NV substation. But you can also choose networks that are near the edge, so really far from the NV substation. And you could expect maybe to see more voltage drop issues there. You can mix it and you can also choose which ones you want to model in detail. And to choose here, if you click on the step-by-step -step guide, you can see the numbers of the networks can you see can you see the pop-up window? Yeah, we can, Miriam. Good. So you can uh, get the numbers to check, like for example, 
1153 is a network that is close to the transformer, to the, to, to the primary, v versus 1175 is really far. So you'd expect to see much more voltage issues on the 1175. And so you have this flexibility of choosing those networks. And here, the really interesting part is those demand and generation profiles. So we're letting people simulate the installation of a solar plant at, connected at MV, and we're making available an output in the summer, an output in the winter. And you can also upload your own data. We are also letting them simulate connecting a fast charging station. So this urban network is like a town of 20,000 population. And with a town in 20,000 population, you'd expect to have a couple of charging stations with those big chargers installed. And this is what we're trying to do here at MV. LV, you can uh, use some of the smart meter data we made available or upload your own. Same for this crowd charge, WPD, electric vehicle data is available. You can uh, use it. The same, the solar output PV, and also uh, some four profiles of heat pump data. So I'm going to try now a simulation with an urban network. I'll leave it, uh, maybe let's put near edge. I'm going to upload some CSV data and I'm going to upload data provided by Ryan. I'll choose here, maybe urban uh, electric vehicle and heat pump and uh, heat pumps. Okay, and then I click submit. And it should take around maybe less than a minute, supposedly. And we can see, so those five networks that we low voltage networks where the houses are actually connected, modeled in detail, we're seeing definitely issues with 1145, 1165. There are voltage drop issues around midnight and, he, and around the usual peak. So these octopus uh, customers have shifted their peak outside of the usual 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. in the UK to midnight. And we're assuming here with the simulation that everyone is doing that because they have an incentive to do that. And it created a new peak, a new problem on the network around midnight that you can see here. So this is voltage issues. We can see also transformer powers. There are no issues on the transformer powers, neither on the, uh, neither on the primary nor on the secondary. Uh, the, yeah, the, the primary feeder loading, so those cables outside of the primary, one of them is having an issue. Uh, no problem with the MV voltage, only with the LV voltage that I showed first. This is showing just the shape of the network so that you know where are things. And this is showing the shape of the uh, smart, an average smart meter profile from the data. If we had chosen to upload uh, fast charging data, you would, have uh, you would have seen also the uh, profile of those fast charging stations. So you can save all these all these figures, and also in some cases where it makes sense, you can download the CSV file. And basically, that's it. This is the resources section. Please, if you do try uh, event and have some feedback, we are very happy to hear it. So thank you. And I guess now it's over to Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Miriam. So Ryan, if you uh, get your slides going. Yeah, let's give this a go. So hopefully you can see um, some slides full screen. Yep. Cool. Um, so yeah, just uh, very briefly before I start. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm Ryan and I work at Optimus Energy Centre for Net Zero. My background is, is really as a data scientist at electric vehicles. Um, as was mentioned at the start, I really kind of close to my heart working on a on an electric vehicle commercial trial for quite a while. So really great to be speaking to you all today. Uh, but this, this side of the talk will be speaking just a little bit about who we are, because we're quite a new team. Uh, then I'll talk about this collaboration specifically and just kind of talk a little bit more about um, the types of customers we have and tariffs and how that kind of differs 
from uh, different uh, like other data sets in the literature. And then I'll kind of talk about where this work kind of fits into the stuff that we're uh, doing and uh, part of our research agenda. Um, so just really briefly, it was kind of covered at the start, but we are a research unit founded by Octopus Energy. Um, and basically we're just trying to uh, do some research looking at faster, fairer and more affordable energy transition. So we, we really work at the intersection of tech, energy and climate. And we've got on our team people who are kind of policy and climate policy people, but also people who are kind of data scientists, data engineers. Um, and I, I think we believe that by, by having that kind of team spread, we're kind of maybe quite unique from maybe like a think tank or, or, or somebody else. So we, we really are a kind of data driven research unit. Um, and I guess our overall principle is trying to build a better kind of future energy landscape with the various partners that we work with. So we, we do a couple of things. Um, and so we do have access to um, a lot of octopus energy data, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And so we are able to kind of conduct our own independence analyses where it makes sense. I'll talk a little bit around some of the products and tools that we're building, but the focus really of this talk is that we know we can't do everything and we're quite a small team. So it's really important for us that we collaborate with uh, academics and form commercial partnerships where it makes sense, where people have the, the expertise um, for, for, for problems where they might be able to use kind of uh, our data or our expertise kind of in a complementary way. Um, and yeah, uh, I think that's basically everything on this slide. I think to, I think, I mean, hopefully you're all kind of familiar with Octopus Energy and, and who they are, but they are um, a renewable energy kind of retail provider for customers, but also businesses. Um, and part of the Octopus Energy group, um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge spread of companies now. So we've got people who work specifically on electric vehicle leasing schemes. Uh, there's Octopus Energy Generation who own and operate generation assets like wind and solar farms. There's the business and Octopus Energy group consumer retail businesses and uh, loads more uh, who are part of that kind of Octopus Energy Group family. So really our kind of unique selling point as a, as a research unit is that we do get access to um, all of that data. Um, and we, we do have a relationship with Octopus Energy there. That means we can kind of use that for our research to try to understand um, what the future energy system might look like. And I think a lot of people on Octopus are, um, some of them are just kind of regular customers on fixed tariffs, but Octopus Energy is also trialing quite a lot of different innovative tariffs. And we do have a lot of customers on those. So we believe that those tariffs are gonna become more and more commonplace in the future. So that's why we like to think that we've got a bit of an insight into what kind of the energy landscape will look like in the future with our data. Um, and, and, and like I mentioned, we, we do have a lot of data scientists and data engineers on the team. So we are a very, very young kind of organization. So we were only founded last year. Um, and in, in case you didn't know about Octopus Energy, they um, operate now in 14 countries and they actually license their Kraken software to uh, various different energy suppliers. So they actually kind of operate um, or they kind of, kind of uh, serve kind of 25 million customers globally um, through that. So we do have access to um, a, a lot of that data. Um, so just a little bit on kind of where, where and how we work before I talk about the specifics of this uh, collaboration specifically. Um, I think so the way that we like to talk about it is that there's kind of four areas that we're kind of really interested in. And the next slide will have quite a lot of words, but um, uh, I'll kind of summarize it on, on the slide afterwards. But these, these kind of four categories are supposed to represent uh, consumers, businesses, the grid and different places. So um, we believe that in each of these kind of four areas, what we're really interested in researching is how these different uh, entities who are gonna be a massive part of the future energy system, how they behave today and how they might behave in the future, how they can use technology to enable that and what the kind of policy ramifications and implications are. So how can we better design policy to, to kind of unblock um, kind of, yeah, uh, uh, barriers that um, is, is kind of in our way. So these are the kind of four areas I won't talk about that I won't go into all the detail but really we can summarize this as so there's quite a lot there but we know that we can't cover all of that as a small team so because we 
have access to a lot of the Oxford Energy data specifically for consum like consumers, customers, but also businesses. Uh, we generally take the research lead on those projects. So we either run those projects independently using Oxford Energy data, or we work with others. And uh, yeah, we, we're specifically interested in working with people who are interested in looking at the energy transition, uh, looking at kind of automation, um, but also um, yeah, just interesting ways that they might be able to use our data. We know that we're not like full experts on um, the grid, so distribution network operators, but also ESO. So what we tend to do there is form partnerships with people who have more uh, knowledge than us in that space. And we complement that with kind of our experience in consumer behavior or business uh, understanding, but also we can provide data uh, in that case as well. So to kind of summarize some of the previous research we've done before I talk a lot about this partnership, we've done, we've done a few kind of um, uh, academic partnerships and collaborations where, so for in an advanced infrastructure collaboration, we looked at using our data to understand heating demand in London and what that might look like on the LV substation network. Uh, with Crampton Associates, we were looking at um, low carbon technology uh, behavior and how receptive people were to price signals. So their price elasticity. Um, we've done some independent research on looking at how people adopt heat pumps, which should be published uh, before the end of the month. Uh, and then we've got this partnership, which I'll talk a little bit more about now, uh, which was kind of also looking at uh, the LV, but also MV level, uh, but also looking at kind of potentially different um, consumer behaviors in, in the smart meter data that we have. So just really quickly on the data used in the collaboration. So Mir Miriam touched on this. We so we sent through some aggregated smart meter data, so there's no customer information about their end panel location. But we did uh, give some interesting variables to break it down by, so um, a cold winter, a mild winter, or, or summer. And what you can see in this graph, um, I think Miriam probably presented slightly nicer <laughs> graphs than I did. But what you can see is that typically customers without any low carbon technologies will have this kind of quite typical kind of four till seven peak. Um, and typically they'll use more energy in the winter compared to the summer, hence this line is on top. Um, and yeah, that's just yeah, due to heating. Um, we also sent through um, customers who have an electric vehicle and who um, smart charge uh, from basically 30 minutes past midnight uh, onwards. And the reason for this, so th th this bottom graph here is supposed to show all, all of the customers who are on this tariff called Octopus Go. And uh, some of those customers will have a charging event, which kind of looks like this. And some of them, they might just like not charge that day or something like that. So we can identify this as like them potentially charging versus them not. And these are the average profiles of charge events. And the, the reason why this, um, this kind of real world behavior that we see in Octopus Go is kind of different from a lot of other data sets also uh, in the literature that, uh, that Miriam presented is that this tariff specifically incentivizes people to charge overnight. So it actually has really, really cheap rates from 30 minutes past midnight until uh, 4.30 in the morning. There are some various different differences in, in the tariffs, but, but usually it's overnight. And that's 5p per kilowatt hour charging, uh, which is really cheap in, in the current market. It has actually just gone up to 7.5p per kilowatt hour. But if you have an electric vehicle, uh, then it would definitely make sense for you to be on this tariff. And uh, you can kind of set your charge point uh, uh, to just kind of automate against those, those times. And the reason why that's different from a lot of previous charging behavior, perhaps in the early or mid 2010s, would be that typically people would have just come home from their day of work and kind of immediately plug in and start charging. And so actually it would just exacerbate this kind of typical um, evening peak. Whereas what we see in our customers, because we have specific tariffs designed to incentivize a shift in behavior, is that actually we see effectively all of our electric vehicle customers do charge overnight. And so what we wanted this project to explore is like, does that create a new peak? And does that create potential problems for the LB network? And as Miriam just showed, um, the answer is that it might do in some situations. We also sent through some data um, for customers who don't just have electric vehicles. So they might have um, solar or battery um, um, low carbon technologies. So in which case they can't go on Octopus Go because that's an electric vehicle only tariff. <clears throat> but what Octopus also offers is something called the Agile tariff. So in the Agile tariff price, it, you, you get notified at four o'clock on one day what the prices are going to be for the following day. 
uh, and prices are half hourly, supposed to kind of be reflecting the, the wholesale market prices. Uh, at the moment, the prices are basically always at the price cap, so um, it's not that, that great at the moment. But um, for the date, for the period that we sent the data through, prices were really varying around these times. So here is just a typical kind of um, Octopus Energy Agile pricing, um, where there are is generally cheap cheaper in the morning when there is a lot of supply compared to demand. It's typically really expensive during the kind of yeah four till seven window, and customers who have a battery or kind of solar. Uh, but don't have an EV might choose to go on the Octopus Agile tariff because they know that they can, for example, charge up their battery overnight and use it during these more expensive times. And as I think this is a kind of typical fixed cost during it at the same time. So you can see that it is actually cheaper. So what this graph over here shows is these are the customers who have battery and solar. And what you can see is that, uh, yeah, typically they would actually charge overnight and they have a less pronounced peak um, during peak hours. So we like to believe that these tariffs are kind of quite different from a lot of the stuff that's that's in the literature. And what we wanted to understand through this collaboration was how do these behaviors manifest themselves uh, on, on the side of the grid and the LV network. Um, and it's important to understand as we start to promote and design all of these new tariffs, which incentivize a shift in behavior, how we can actually make that um, uh, a, a good thing for the grid as well. So ju just to say, we will be releasing a blog post soon on the different types of energy demand profiles that we see in our data and how they vary. So one thing we want to do with our research is move away from kind of quite average profiles and really look at the variability um, in the data, which is kind of what Miriam showed looking at the uh, percentiles uh, and so on. So just really quickly on how this work fits into kind of our current work um, and, and what we're thinking about. So. Um, as I mentioned, we want this work was specifically looking at designing a grid fit for the future. And we believe that using real world data is, as, as Miriam also um, said, one of, the, one of the best ways to do that. And we've got data for customers on very different tariff types um, with, uh, and I think proportionally quite a, a lot of low carbon technologies compared to um, other energy suppliers. And we can use this data to understand the grid impact. So. What this work really focused on is kind of, if we were to look at scaling up um, kind of penetrations for electric vehicles and heat pumps and so on, what under what conditions today would this grid be placed under strain with uh, voltage drops or uh, exceeding statutory limits and so on? Um, so that's really what this work looked at. And I guess the way this sits into our current thinking is kind of whenever we kind of have sat down and kind of crunched through all the findings for this work, how can we mitigate against uh, these the conditions that that lead to the grid being placed under strain with potentially different demand profiles and can we um, maybe at Octopus Energy or as the research lab informing Octopus Energy how can we incentivize such a behavior so can we design tariffs that give the grid long term stability or is it that um, maybe in the future as these DNOs transition to more service based models is it that actually um, one off events to be able to turn down uh, your demand uh, might be um, might, might be the way to to mean that we don't need to do network reinforcement, which is quite costly. So one project that Octopus is involved in is something called Crowdflex, uh, and you can look this up online. So this is a, a trial. Well, the first phase is already finished, so the report is out with uh, National Grid ESO looking at if we were to send an email to customers asking them to turn down their demand or turn up their demand, um, are they but first of all, do they even want to sign up to such a thing? Uh, but also for those who do sign up, what is the kind of success rate of them actually effectively turning up or turning down their demand? So really using consumers as a kind of demand side response resource. Um, and uh, National Grid's really keen to understand the potential of that. And we're, we're really start, we're, we're starting to develop a bit more work along that um, kind of theme of thinking uh, with Crowdflex. Um, and the, the kind of what, what that really shows is that electric vehicles and using smart charging is one of the electric vehicle owners are, are, are really, really good at turning down or turning up their demand, basically shifting their demand around because it's quite a lot of uh, load on the grid. And typically they only need to charge for kind of a couple of hours anyway. So we, we've, we found some early insights there and where we want our work to, to go in the future with this is that um, so looking at flexibility generally is a really important area for us. I'm really interested to have some conversations along those lines. 
like I say, that uh, the grid is really interested in trying to quantify the impact of this and what is the size of the opportunity for commercial or kind of consumer flexibility. But also, is it possible for us to move beyond Go? So with Octopus Go, we gave this kind of four hour window where pricing was really cheap. But what we just saw in Miriam's talk is that that could potentially create a new peak. So another product or tariff that Octopus has out is called Intelligent Octopus. And what Intelligent Octopus does is it says, uh, currently it's, it only works for a few vehicle models, but they're kind of expanding that. It's kind of, if you just tell us what you want your ending state of charge to be uh, and what time you want it done by, we will manage your charge during that window. So uh, instead of it just being um, that you charge at kind of the maximum rate, but uh, like almost like deferred charging, which is what happens on Go. So you're still charging at seven kilowatts, but you're just shifting it. What Intelligent Octopus does is kind of dynamically um, kind of uh, make sure that you uh, charge during that window. So you might not charge at the kind of maximum capacity and so on. And they might be able to, in the future, if the grid gave them, the appropriate signals to be able to to automatically like through automation respond to these kind of um grid constraint events um but also ensuring that the customers uh kind of uh, default settings are still uh kind of adhered to so the customer will always wake up with their their vehicle on 80 percent or 90 percent state of charge whatever default they set it by but octopus if you like manages the charging in the background so in terms of our current activities, we are really in the next kind of couple of months going to be researching a lot on consumers and businesses. So we will be releasing something on the energy demand profiles of our customers with low carbon technologies. And we will be investigating the charging behaviors of customers who own these electric vehicles. So how long are they plugged in for? Um, what time do they start and end charging and stuff like that? We're also, this. what this work showed us is that we, we um, th there's a lot of appetite to kind of really explore uh, th this kind of data. So um, different electricity load profiles, and um, we're trying to look at ways um, to, to, to open up that. So whether or not it's um, specific exact rows of customer data is obviously quite difficult with GDPR, but if we can build models that, that generate realistic energy load profiles under certain conditions, then we think that would be really helpful. Uh, and obviously we need to uh, finish this project and par partnership as well. Uh, th this, this, this one on the far right is less important uh, for this specific context of, of this call, but we are also interested and we have another uh, very interesting project looking at how we can kind of co-design future places more specifically taking the grid into consideration. So that, that's a little bit of our current activities, but in, in about two minutes, I wanted to do some really shameless promotion, uh, which is that if anyone is uh, really looking for a kind of podcast that, to, to kind of dig into these kind of ideas a bit more, we do have a kind of um, Inside the Energy Transition podcast uh, on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and all of that thing. Um, so if you're interested in kind of, uh, if you're looking for a new podcast, then go and check that out. And the other thing, which I think will be really useful for, uh, the, the audience and community here is that we are, we're starting to host, um, some talks looking at, um, energy tech specifically, uh, in our London offices, uh, in the Octopus Energy offices. Uh, the, the first one is, uh, next week on Tuesday. Um, and you can find all the details on our website, centerfornetzero.org, but we've got some really interesting speakers, one who's using machine learning for photovoltaic forecasting, and one who's looking at natural language processing techniques uh, to spread, uh, to look at the spread of climate misinformation. And if anyone here in this community would like to give a talk at these things, then I'd love to hear from you. So uh, yeah, we can chat about that as well. But that's, that's the end of my slides. Um, so if I stop sharing, 